centuries after the first Europeans landed in the Americas, King George declared Aboriginal title for all lands not ceded by treaties. The Royal Proclamation of 1763 laid the foundation for Canada's relationship with its Indigenous peoples, and thus began the darkest period in our country's history. This is a story many Canadians do not know. This is a history of the Indigenous peoples of Canada, told by our people, our perspectives, and a pathway to hope and victory. The idea that Indigenous people weren't human came from doctrine espoused by the Spanish when they came to Central America. At first contact, 50% uh, of the Indigenous population was wiped out due to disease. The Indian Act had a devastating impact on us, on our governments, on our economies, on everything that we did. We're second-class citizens living in third-world conditions in a first-world country. Canada is ranked number one in the world for quality of life. When you factor in the Indigenous community, we drop down to number 30. If you look across Canada, almost every First Nation has had lands taken away from them. I'm not going to turn the page on history until Canadians gain a broader understanding because we're not treated very well in this country. That needs to change. Our story starts prior to first contact with Europeans. Over 70 Indigenous groups stretched across Canada and differed from one another on the basis of language, culture, religion, and social hierarchies. From the Inuit to the Haida, and from the Mohawk to the Mi'kmaq, each nation had full autonomy. Long before Europeans came, there was a vast economy in North America and South America. Trade networks brought traders from the South, even by canoe. Our people on the West Coast traded right down into California. If we look at pre-Columbus, there's an estimated amount of 125 million Indigenous people living in North America and South America. There were some 50 to 60 different nations. There were tribal groups within those nations. They were recognized as the sovereigns, if you will, over their territories. We had our own laws, customs, and traditions, but more importantly, we had our own economy. Most people don't realize that there was a trading language known as Chinook that went from Mexico to Alaska. It was a common language and we have uh, archaeological evidence of that trading taking place because we have found things virgin to an area that found themselves in Mexico, for example, and stuff from Mexico up in northern British Columbia. Our canoes would be sold and traded to Hooligan Greece, interior to BC. So we know that there was a real robust economy. Yes, they'd find our seashells, which some of them were actually forms of money used to purchase goods and to count goods as well. Awadu, dejidadu ne, agueno ge giga. Kaliwayan dagun dunga inga wani slate. Te dadayang dag. 
Right from science to astronomy to medicine, farming, gatherer, hunters, we were advanced. I would say that we were as modern, if not more so, in many aspects than the Europeans that claimed to have discovered us. Christopher Columbus's journey to the Americas, while celebrated by future settlers, was the beginning of the cultural genocide of indigenous populations that would last for centuries. The first European settlers of North America systematically began an assault on indigenous nations in an attempt to dominate the land and all of its resources. What came with Columbus was war, weapons, and oppression. The most damning impact was their diseases, diseases like smallpox, bubonic plague, chickenpox, cholera, the common cold, diphtheria, influenza, malaria, measles, scarlet fever, and many others. These diseases would travel to every corner of the Americas, killing families, villages, and nations. The loss of people in the Americas was so dramatic, it changed the Earth's climate. Abandoned farmland overgrew with vegetation, creating such massive carbon sinks that over the course of 200 years, carbon dioxide levels changed globally and the Earth cooled as a result. It's hard to imagine how many people died. Our way of living entirely destroyed for the sake of Europeans. We've lived off our land for thousands of years. They wonder why we're angry. When the economic system got here, first thing they were after was gold. The European market had been filled with Spanish gold, plundered from the Indians. The next thing they came for, both the east and west coast of Canada, were the fish. Then they seen the vast forest resources, trees everywhere. Forest companies were popping up, canneries were popping up, logging companies, huge companies, mining companies, making a fortune. Nobody asked us. Nobody compensated us. Nobody even said excuse us. They just did it. And they wonder why the Indians are poor. They wonder why we're angry. In 1763, the powers of Europe concluded the first truly global conflict, the Seven Years' War. A British victory resulted in France ceding most of its land in eastern North America. But after peace was finalized, the question of what to do with the indigenous inhabitants of North America became a fiercely debated topic. There was no formal law in place that offered a framework for dealing with them. The remedy? The Royal Proclamation, which was signed in October of 1763. For the first time in an international document, Indigenous rights were mentioned. King George said that the Indian nations were living under the dominion and protection of the Crown. The Royal Proclamation said that Indians owned the land. The Royal Proclamation set out the Indian territories treaty process used by Canada and the United States to purchase the land from the Indians. People were starving. Game was scarce and the fur trade wasn't as reliable as it was before. That's why the chiefs actually signed the treaties was because our way of life was no longer sustainable. The Royal Proclamation was the law of the land in dealing with First Nations until Canadian Confederation in 1867. Following Confederation, it was the Indian Act of 1876 that defined the terms by which the federal government interacted with Native people throughout the country. The Indian Act established total government control over Native people's lives. Good old John A. MacDonald, our first uh, prime minister, was a racist, like 
Many of his contemporaries, yes, John A. MacDonald called us savage. Savage means, in French, people of the forest. And a common statement by so-called civilized Europeans. Genocide, as I understand it, is indiscriminate killing of one group of people because of their race. When thousands of children die in religious institutions supported by the government, pursuant to hunger experiments that we're just now learning about, that's genocide. They did not recognize the inherent rights of First Nation peoples. It didn't take too many years after contact before reserves were established. In the 1880s, the Indian Act implemented a regime consisting of a chief and band counselor, replacing traditional governance models. Colonial government drew lines around our villages and said, we have to stay there. It was a way to undermine the society that existed for our Indigenous people, to take away one of the pillars of our community. It was a way to control. You had the Indian agent that determined everything in the community, who starved and who didn't. And then the government passed laws prohibiting us from potlatching, from wearing our regalia, from having a drum, from singing and dancing. A lot of our people were arrested. We were not allowed to practice our spiritual beliefs, and the various churches found their way into Canada and started converting us, so to speak. We have found ourselves displaced, our culture, traditions, language, spirituality, our economies were displaced. The first attempts at assimilation came from the Indian Act and its objectives and started to dictate how we should live. The Indian Act's darkest legacy was a means to deal with the assimilation of Indigenous people and one of the most damning actions was the establishment of residential schools. It's estimated that 150,000 children were taken from their parents and forced into government-sanctioned schools. The vision was to isolate children as young as four into the dominant culture, thus the infamous quote, to kill the Indian in the child. The whole purpose of the school was not education, but it was, in fact, to make all of those Indian children white and Christian. Breaking them down, breaking the family structure down, breaking the community structure down, the amount of experimentation that occurred on children who were, for example, denied dental care who were denied food, scrubbing the floors on their hands and knees, being stripped of their own clothing, and to having their hair cut. Hair is very sacred to our people. The legacy of this system would prove to be another horrific trauma inflicted upon Indigenous peoples with the last school closing in the 1990s. It's estimated that 6,000 children died. That trauma gets covered up by addictions. It's only one generation away. It's, it's not an ancient history. It's something that very much, you know, uh, alive and well, and the memory is still there. For the 600 diverse tribes in North America, the assault over hundreds of years destroyed their people, land, and culture, and created social and economic issues beyond imagination. Despite the conflict between Indigenous people and Canada, thousands of Indigenous men and women volunteered to fight in World War I. And that was because of the alliance with, that we felt we had with Queen Victoria. That alliance would erode as Indian Act changes increasingly marginalized Indigenous people. 
the First World War, veterans uh, came back and found that, as my grandfather said, uh, when I left, I had land, and when I came back, I had none. The Indian Act had stripped veterans of their status if they had been living off the reserve longer than four years. After 1921, when the Canadian government, in the face of all the historic developments, treaty making, the Royal Proclamation, all of that, they simply said that Indigenous people had no rights in British Columbia to the land. And as a consequence, they pressed for an amendment of the Indian Act that said that Indians could no longer hire a lawyer. We were forbidden to participate in provincial elections. Our tools uh, to create economies were taken away from us and given to bureaucrats in Ottawa or Victoria. In 1939, World War II erupted, and once again, Indigenous people turned out in the thousands to volunteer. One of those who enlisted was an Anishinaabe named Tommy George Prince, who had become one of the most decorated Canadians of World War II, earning some of the highest awards for courage and bravery. He joined an elite Special Forces Battalion, which the Germans called the Devil's Brigade. Over the course of the war, the brigade engaged in extremely dangerous missions behind enemy front lines, wearing moccasins, Tommy George would slip into enemy territory to engage in acts of sabotage and reconnaissance. The Germans thought he was a ghost or a devil. He was summoned to Buckingham Palace, where King George VI decorated him with both a military medal and, on behalf of the President of the United States, the Silver Star with ribbons. Only three other Canadians were awarded both medals, Tommy Prince, a man who sacrificed for his country without question was not allowed to have citizenship at that time. The end of the war would galvanize the demand for change among Indigenous people. When our veterans came back from the Second World War, that's when I believe uh, the modern Indian movement or First Nations movement really occurred uh, because our veterans came back and said, we want to be treated the same as everybody else. The Citizenship Act was amended in 1956 to include all First Nations in order to retroactively fulfill Canada's obligations for signing on to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Additionally, land claims were no longer prohibited. The Indian Act was amended in 1951, and it lifted this bar against pursuing rights and organization. And so Indigenous people began fighting again for their rights. The 85-year battle against the injustice of the Indian Act was slowly changing. What became apparent to the government of Canada is they could not effectively manage. And in the late 1960s, program delivery delegation started to occur. Many people thought it was self-government, but in fact, it was just managing money, managing programs, and delivering programs. That was the start of something that was really quite unique because it started to empower individuals to believe that they could make decisions for themselves, they could be governments uh, unto themselves. The next major step would be in the form of judicial recognition of Aboriginal land rights in a Supreme Court decision known as the Calder case. The Nishkas were the first one to form the Nishka Tribal Council and they launched a declaration in the Supreme Court asking for a declaration that they still own their own territory. In this panel of seven judges, three judges agreed with the province that Indigenous rights were extinguished by the extension of sovereignty and by the creation of land laws that applied to Nishka territory. Three judges said no. One thing that all six judges agreed on was that the Nishkas did have rights, that they did have some rights to the land. That was a position contrary to the, this 1921 decision of this commission. So it was a technical defeat for the Nishkas, but because six of the judges said these rights existed, the federal government started once again to negotiate with the Nishkas about land rights. That laid the foundation for the BC Treaty process that took on the larger part of British Columbia that had not felt subject to a treaty. So the Calder case was extremely important. 
One of the greatest things that Frank Calder said, he said that the Nishkas are not on trial. Canadian justice is on trial. <laughs> what a great line. The rights of the Calder case would be challenged with force on the Listagouche Reserve by the Quebec government in June of 1981. In 1981, we had a massive raid where over 200 SQ officers invaded our community. The heart of the issue was salmon fishing rights of the Mi'kmaq. We were told that we didn't have that right and we didn't have the right to make a livelihood out of fishing salmon. This normally quiet, traditional community felt the full impact of the Canadian police. Full on riot gear, walking down the road, marching down the road. It was about trying to set a very aggressive uh, message. The Listagouche court challenges would be the first in a number of cases regarding Aboriginal treaty rights. Allowing Aboriginal people to catch and sell fish under the historical treaties would finally be established in 1999 when Donald Marshall Jr. won his case at the Supreme Court of Canada. The recognition of Aboriginal and resource rights began to solidify the following year during the repatriation of the Constitution from England. For the first time in Canadian law, Section 35 meant that Aboriginal treaty rights and Aboriginal rights were going to be recognized in the Canadian Constitution. Ultimately, what this was about is equality. We were to share this land with the Europeans and we were to have an interest in our traditional lands and we were to benefit from our traditional lands in ways that we had done before they had arrived. Our children started to be educated, some of them started going to university, and we realized, I believe, that there was a greater opportunity for First Nations, and there should be a greater opportunity for First Nations in this country. One of the biggest challenges that Canadians don't often realize is the social crisis that occurs in our community is the result of the poverty in our communities. And that's a cost to Canada that most non-Indigenous community members don't even understand. The ability of Native nations to collect taxes to promote their own interests was critical. With financial autonomy would come social, cultural, and political revitalization and power. The question is, how do you go from being a ward of the government to a government unto itself? In 1988, the Indigenous-led Kamloops Amendment received royal assent. This amendment led directly to the formation of the Indian Taxation Advisory Board, which allowed Indigenous people to levy and collect property taxes on designated lands. This increased their revenue options and expanded their jurisdiction. You've got this kind of jurisdiction. Uh, you've got that, those levers of, uh, on the economy that every other level of government has got. And without it, you're gonna be dependent. It is about time that we Aboriginal people stood up for our rightful place in this Canadian society. In Manitoba, Treaty Aboriginal Elijah Harper became elected as a provincial politician. The Canadian government attempted to bring Quebec into the Constitution in 1987 by identifying Quebec as a distinct society. It was called the Meech Lake Accord. It was written without consulting or including Aboriginals as their own distinct society. The policies of the government have been one of racism policies of assimilation, policies of genocide. That has been the history of Canada. And a In order for the Meech Lake Accord to pass, all 10 provinces had to ratify the accord. In Manitoba, this required the unanimous consent of each elected member of the legislature, 
and one defiant member stalled the process for ratification. So it's the end of meet like this tomorrow at 12.30. Well, that's the way it looks like. The pressure to pass Meech Lake was intense. And we will use the democratic principles in this country to obtain our rightful place in Canada. One voice that made a difference that impacted, you know, future generations. It was a powerful moment in Canadian and Indigenous history. What courage and what strength to have somebody up there really stand up. What we're fighting for is democracy. Democracy for ourselves and democracy for all our Canadians. It set the road ahead for Indigenous people. It really enshrined our Aboriginal rights and titles into the Constitution. We have won today in Manitoba and said no to Meech Lake. It helped us get organized. It helped bring us together, unify us. The biggest uh, um, and most noteworthy event was, of course, Oka. In July of 1990, a dispute over the proposed expansion of a golf course and luxury condominiums using native burial grounds quickly escalated into an armed struggle between Mohawks and the Canadian military. You know, the Indigenous people were trying to protect sacred land from being overrun by development. When it escalated beyond just a roadblock, firearms got involved. It became an international incident. Other countries were beginning to pay attention to what Canada was doing with indigenous people. We'd never seen the indigenous agenda so high in Canada. We'd become a priority. The larger thing that happened, though, for indigenous people was that they became politicized. I appeal to the uh, to the Premier Brassa, as he is, as he's challenged the Aboriginal leaders to resolve this peacefully, to open his door and start talking this at the political level. They became aware that there was a group of Indigenous people fighting for their rights. Oka started other demonstrations in Canada. Demonstrations that included blockage of uh, railway lines, blockage of highways, the stopping of traffic to make a point that First Nations rights and title and claims to the land had to be recognized. Indigenous people began to come out of their communities. They began to speak out. They began to march. They began to get activated into action. And I think the Oka crisis was the beginning of that. In 1997, the Supreme Court of Canada issued a landmark decision in Delgamuk versus British Columbia concerning the definition, context, and extension of Aboriginal title. The ruling stated that Aboriginal title was not extinguished by the assertion of Canadian sovereignty or provincial laws, and it was protected by Section 35 of the Constitution. It was time to take the court's decision and manifest it into self-reliance. I returned to my community. Prior to that, I was in international business and did a lot of dealings with banks and raised a lot of money. I needed a short-term loan for 30 days. I went into the bank and said we needed this money. His response was, well, where's the minister? Anything you want to do under the act, 
we need to get approval from some higher level of government, a Minister of Indian Affairs. And it was the first time that I had realized that Indians couldn't borrow money by themselves without a minister. And I realized then that bankers don't have a sense of humor because I said to him, I didn't think I was in a church. He didn't laugh, uh, <laughs> but it pointed to a huge issue. Banks rely on security. Indian lands cannot be used as chattel for mortgages, for loans, and uh, with Indian reserves, uh, you had nothing to borrow against. Finally, on April 1st, 2006, the First Nations Fiscal Management Act came into force. It created an optional framework to promote social and economic development for First Nations. There were three organizations which were created by the Fiscal Management Act. The First Nations Tax Commission, which supports interested First Nations in developing a taxation regime, the First Nations Financial Management Board, which supports First Nations to develop sound finance and administrative governance best practices. The First Nations Financial Management Board certifies First Nations, which in turn allows those nations to apply to borrow money from the First Nations Finance Authority. The First Nations Finance Authority offers access to long-term affordable financing through the capital market. To this day, the First Nations Fiscal Management Act is the most successful Indigenous-led legislation in Canadian history. We have to have a constitutional recognition of our governments, and we have to be considered as an 11th province within the, the Canadian constitution. My name is Christian Sinclair, Chief of the Opaskarak Cree Nation, located in northern Manitoba on Treaty 5 territory. While I'm new to uh, politics, I was elected in the fall of 2016 along with my council. When we came in, unfortunately, Opaskwak was on the verge of third party, and our corporation was near bankruptcy within six to 12 months of going totally bankrupt. Under the Indian Act, third party management left many nations in perpetual economic crisis with absolutely no control or oversight over who managed their money and how. It became a new form of colonialism. And we were in a situation where we were generating good revenues, but unfortunately we were spending more than we were making and did a analysis on where our community was and what we needed to do to stabilize it and get it back on strong footing, rebuild our pillars and build a strong foundation to allow us to move forward. Stronger economies means more money for services, food and education, and more than that, it means sharing the same dream as every other Canadian. A dream that sees past color, creed, and offers hope to all. With a brighter economic future, many communities are finally feeling empowered. The difference between this and this is imagination. I grew up here basically in the 60s and the 70s. Remember to was a, was a backwood community. When I was growing up, the jobs in Member 2 were chief, band counselor, welfare officer, social worker, and bus driver. And so the stereotypical Indian was jobless. The stereotypical Indian was someone who had low self-esteem, was abusing drugs or alcohol. The single biggest issue we have to deal with in Canada for First Nations people is the issue of poverty. And the only way to break the back of poverty in this country is to have four generations of high school graduates. In Canada today, Indigenous students struggle to achieve success. With graduation rates about 44%, Indigenous students' outcomes are dismal. The key factor was always education. Those that were younger than myself, who spent most of their time in public schools, uh, we lost our language, our culture. That's one of the things that's been robbed from us as First Nations people, was the participation in an educational system that's ours and unique and, and designed to meet our needs. And finally, about 2016, was our turn to build our school. To come on in and see some of the things that we do about our education program here in Membertoe.
Our education program is built on five pillars. Uh, we call them the straight A's to education. They're built on attendance, achievement, attainment, aspiration, and Aboriginal identity. Our education system has gone through a dramatic transformation. Language and cultural identity is so important in our school. Every one of our students gets Mi'kmaq language every day for at least 45 minutes. Infrastructure additions like a dental clinic and a full-service cafeteria allow hygiene and nutrition standards to skyrocket, enabling healthier students to be more focused and happier while learning. This cafeteria seats about 100. We do, we do three different lunches, three different breakfasts, and, and, and one after-school snack program. Say hi, everybody. Our students have approximately a 90% attendance rate. Our graduation rate, we are upwards of 90% now for the last three or four years. This dream catcher that we have up here, it's a symbol that they hold their dreams in their own hands. It's through their own work that they can make those dreams realized. For Member Two, building Indigenous-centric schools has both empowered people and helped ease the trauma and pain caused by the residential school system, where 6,000 children died during one of the darkest periods of Aboriginal cultural repression and attempted assimilation. Mr. Speaker, I stand before you today to offer an apology to former students of Indian residential schools. We now recognize that it was wrong to separate children from rich and vibrant cultures and traditions that it created a void in many lives and communities, and we apologize for having done this. We now recognize that in separating children from their families, we undermine the ability of many to adequately parent their own children, and so the seeds for generations to follow, and we apologize for having done this. We now recognize that far too often these institutions gave rise to abuse or neglect and were inadequately controlled. And we apologize for failing to protect you. Not only did you suffer these abuses as children, but as you became par parents, you were powerless to protect your own children from suffering the same experience. And for this, we are sorry. The Government of Canada sincerely apologizes and asks the forgiveness of the Aboriginal peoples of this country for failing them so profoundly. I'm not going to turn the page on history until, as was found in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Canadians gain a broader understanding. The justice system gets a better understanding. The health system gets a better understanding. because we're not treated very well in this country. That needs to change. That needs to change. For many Indigenous people today, poverty is still the norm. In 2007, the United Nations adopted the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It established a minimum standard for their survival, dignity, and well-being of the Indigenous people of the world. UN DRIP, as I prefer to call it, uh, has been a game changer because this is the first time we have the international community setting the standard of what the relationship should be between member states of the UN and its indigenous people. 144 countries voted for UNDRIP 
Canada was one of the four countries that voted against. But almost a decade later, a new government announced Canada's full support of the declaration without qualification. Today, we are addressing Canada's position on the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I'm here to announce on behalf of Canada that we are now a full supporter of the declaration without qualification. I have great pleasure in welcoming the Prime Minister of Canada, His Excellency Justin Trudeau. We now have before us an opportunity to deliver true, meaningful, and lasting reconciliation between Canada and First Nations, the Métis Nation, and Inuit people. So the real question is, how will Canada share its power? How will the provinces share its power with Indigenous governments? In Canada, this means new relationships between the government of Canada and Indigenous peoples. Relationships based on recognition of rights, respect, cooperation, and partnership. We believe that there is an opportunity for Aboriginal rights and title and non-Indigenous rights and title to coexist. So if this government is serious, as well as the provincial governments, then they need to ensure that as First Nations, we are at the table as equal partners. First Nations that uh, endeavor and want to be self-sufficient must have the means for that self-sufficiency. And the means would include a share to benefit themselves, to allow for the economic prosperity of each of the First Nation communities. I think Canadians are investing in Indigenous people. I see it more so now today than years ago. I think it is a wise investment for Canada to invest in Indigenous government's capacity development rather than solely invest in the social cost of poverty. I always think about what our ancestors had. They had much less than what we have now, and they still fought. UNDRIP is being used in our own Canadian courts now as international law to pressure the government into changing policy and following through with treaty negotiations, following through with promises. It's become a hammer. Canada continues to cautiously adopt sections of UNDRIP, and in October of 2019, British Columbia became the first province to table legislation to fully adopt UNDRIP. If you want a future where my children and your children can enjoy equality, where our communities can share in the prosperity of Canada, then I say UN DRIP is the way to go. It's not to be afraid of it. Yes, there's a lot of work, but let's get to work and figure it out. Prominent Indigenous leaders have joined forces with the Institute of Governance on the First Nations Governance Project. In the wake of UNDRIP, this two-phase initiative will begin to define clearly what a nation-to-nation -nation relationship in Canada could be. We will continue to seek justice. World history tells us that oppressed people in the world, doesn't matter where they come from, they'll fight for that. It's natural law. Indigenous people have never, ever been closer to their full rights that existed prior to the arrival of Europeans than they are now. And so the balance is tipping in favor of justice, which delivers hope, a way out of poverty, and a dream of shared abundance with all Canadians.